This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. One concept that I want to start out with is that almost every disease has some genetic component. It could be a large component or a small component. So for example, cystic fibrosis would be a good example of a case where uh, you have a single gene which when mutated leads to a disease. So we'd say that has a large genetic component to it. Um, on the other side is something like HIV AIDS where uh, it might have what you might consider a large environmental component to it. So if you're not exposed to the HIV virus in your environment, then it's very unlikely that you'll just spontaneously develop AIDS. Um, <clears throat> but even something that has a large environmental component like that uh, has some genetic, genetic component to it as well. So for example, in HIV, there are some people that naturally carry a mutation that makes them resistant to HIV. Um, that's well known. There's also probably some other genes that might mediate um, whether people are slow progressors or fast progressors uh, after infection to, to getting AIDS. The diseases that affect most people, though, are probably in this category in the middle, which is a combination of you know, environmental factors and genetic factors. But again, uh, apart from maybe, maybe trauma like this, um, Almost all uh, medical conditions have some kind of uh, genetic component to it. And uh, this is becoming very important now uh, that we're in this post-genomic age of rapidly evolving technology to start measuring uh, all kinds of uh, genomic information. So I'm sure this audience is, is fairly familiar with the, that the human genome has been sequenced and the draft of the human genome was released in 2001 and finally completed in 2004. This was a 13-year effort uh, of an international consortia that cost $3 billion. Now there's about 3 billion base pairs in the human genome, so that's about a buck a base pair. I thought at the time that that wasn't such a bad price. But only a few years after the first uh, draft or the first human genome was released. Now this was a compilation of, of several different people, so it's kind of an average genome. If you want to understand what's going on in any individual, you need to know the DNA sequence of their individual genome. The first individual person's genome was sequenced just a few years later in 2007. And the next one, Jim Watson, was released in 2008. So from $3 billion, uh, Jim Watson's genome was something on the order of uh, $400,000, so that's already a tenfold increase. And that's because of the emergence of new kinds of technologies for the sequencing. And um, it's said that uh, up to this point, DNA sequencing technology was basically following this Moore's law, this principle that uh, the number of transistors you can put on a microchip uh, in computer technology doubles every, every 18 months or something. Now it's actually evolving faster than computer technology. And um, today, uh, there's, when this slide was made, which was a couple of years ago, there were 18 personal genomes that had been sequenced. By now, there's over 10,000 uh, uh, allegedly personal genomes that have been sequenced. Um, it went from $3 billion at the beginning of the decade to now you could get it for uh, um, probably around $5,000. So that's quite a change, and uh, naturally um, there's been a lot of uh, explosion of interest and, and advancement in this area. And of course there's going to be a lot more to come, so this is just one of many, many examples of very large projects. This is the Thousand Genome Project where they're trying to make a deep catalog of genetic variation um, 
throughout the world. So they're looking at different populations. These are just some of the populations that they're looking at. These are European populations up here. These are Asian populations. There are some African populations, and there's many others that are in, in this study. And all this information will be publicly available, and their genome sequences will be available. Um, and even, even my own UC Davis uh, is part of this. Um, we just recently uh, partnered with BGI. BGI, formerly the Beijing Genome Institute, is the largest sequencing entity on the planet. They have about 4,000 employees. And they, can, they have the capacity to sequence about 2,000 complete genomes each day. So they don't just do human genomes. They do a lot of things. They do trees and rice and plants and other kinds of things. But if they were just doing genome, human genome sequences, they could do 2,000 a day. And even in our own uh, genome center uh, at the university, um, we have a machine like this. This is the Illumina High Seq 2500. This is the state of the art right now. Uh, this machine can do about five genomes in a week. Um, and with the new chemistry, the price should come down to about $1,000 for a, a full genome. That's just the sequencing part. Uh, and I'm not going to talk that much about the technology, but. Um, you know, for a long time, I remember when I was a graduate student, uh, they were still trying to sequence the human genome. They were saying, well, take the best labs, you know, 30 years if they work at it all the time. And then, you know, in the year 2001, we had the draft genome. You know, now we have many people sequenced. And the big goal was, can we get the price down so it's $1,000 a genome? You know, maybe 10 years from now, maybe five years from now, maybe next year. Well, now, it's, now we have a $1,000 genome. There's several companies that can do that. So it's getting very cheap. It'll probably get a little cheaper than this, which means that it'll be very easy soon to be able to um, have everyone's genome sequenced who wants to be sequenced. That's not, so that was the state of the art. This is the state of the art uh, tomorrow. Um, this is not quite ready for release, but this is another sequencing machine. You can see it fits in the palm of his hand. This is actually a USB port device. It can stick into your computer. And they say that you can just add a drop of blood to that. And, uh, and it has uh, many advantages over that big machine that I showed you. They claim that a device like this um, would be able to sequence the human genome in about 15 minutes for $150. Now, they haven't done that yet. And we've heard this kind of claim before. But you can see that you know it's continuing to evolve. It's evolving. And it's getting cheaper. And that means that uh, it's an opportunity to try to take advantage of this in the medical arena. Now, all of this, of course, is even being driven further, not just by the technology, but also by groups like 23andMe, so-called direct-to-consumer marketing, where uh, this has really nothing to do with health professionals. Um, this is just a company that can sequence people. And then they, they give a bunch of information. And some of it is, is fairly accurate, I would say, and some of it is questionable. But, uh, but it's certainly changing um, the way that we, that we have to think about genomics, because now it's not, it's changing you know, who has control over this technology. It's not a board of ethicists somewhere in a hospital sitting saying, I wonder if it's ethical to test for the APOE uh, mutation that might uh, cause Alzheimer's. I mean, people will be able to just go out and get this stuff, and then they'll bring it to your doctor. In fact, 23andMe suggests one of the uses of this information is to keep your doctor informed. And I think you know this is very interesting, because I also teach at the medical school at Davis. And uh, I think you know a lot of doctors really, they wouldn't know what to do with the information when it came in, or how to treat it, or if it's accurate, or what to, what to do about it. And so. Um, we have to think a lot about all these changes that are going on. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I know about genomics and how that's affecting medicine. So you'll know a little bit more, hopefully, than when you walked in. So as I said, the human genome has been sequenced. We know that there's about 3 billion base pairs. Um, and since we have two copies of almost every chromosome, there's actually more like 6 billion base pairs of DNA in every cell of our body. There's about 26,000 genes. And we know that all of our DNA, for all us humans, is about 99.5% identical. So we're almost all genetically identical. But that last uh, little bit uh, certainly leaves millions of different uh, genetic variations 
uh, things like uh, SNPs, copy number variants. I'm going to talk about what those are a little bit later. But just differences in our DNA. And those differences in our DNA uh, certainly account for things that we're all familiar with, things like height, eye color, and skin color. They probably have some influence on other traits that maybe we're a little less comfortable thinking about having a genetic component, but things like intelligence, you know, will probably have some genetic component. I used to show this slide and say you can imagine that someone soon will, will open this Pandora's box and start to look at that. I know of already of groups that are looking at this. So all of this is happening. You know. Metabolism of drugs is uh, the way that we metabolize drugs is, is somewhat genetic. And certainly, uh, susceptibility to disease has some genetic component, as I suggested. So let's think about this uh, relationship between genetic variation and disease. So when I talk about variations or variants, these could be mutations, they could be um, other kinds of rearrangements. Um, and they can come from, you know, in two different ways. They could be inherited from our parents, so inherited variation. Um, or they could be de novo, which means that you don't find this kind of genetic variation in, in the parents. It only happened in the child. But we include that as, as variation as well and talk about it. Um, and this kind of um, schematic graph kind of illustrates the relationship between the frequency with which you might expect to find these variations in a population and the effect that they might have on health. Um, and again, this is kind of the dogma way of thinking about genetics. So on the one hand, um, the greatest effect that any mutation or variation could have on, on life is, is death. So on this one hand, the biggest effect size is death. Uh, we expect that essentially we'll never see those kinds of mutations in the population because those people obviously would never be born. So. Uh, it's not every gene when mutated that causes a disease. Some of them are, are embryonic lethal. Um, on the far side, uh, there can be no effect at all. So it's estimated that most of the genetic variation that's in our genome um, has no effect. It doesn't affect our eye color, our height, our susceptibility to cardiovascular disease. It's just uh, an event that occurred, and, um, and it's still around. So those kinds of things can be frequent, um, if, especially if they have no effect on, on, on fitness. So it's kind of within this range, then, that we expect to see variants that affect disease. And there could be things down here that are not frequently found that with a large effect size, and things out here that are found frequently, but we would expect that if they're found frequently, they probably have less of an effect on, on health. So I'll give you some examples. So monogenic disease. These are the, the diseases where there's a single gene disorder, and you mutate that gene, and you end up with that disease. Now, we have 26,000 genes. We only have around 6,000 monogenic disorders. And again, that's because many, many genes, when mutated, will not be compatible with life. Um, monogenic diseases usually uh, involve rare variants with a large effect on the disease. And they usually have a limited environmental component. They're often characterized by early onset, which is consistent with them having a large effect. And they're relatively rare. So this is just a list of some uh, single gene disorders, monogenic disorders. And um, you know some of them are, are fairly well known to most people, sickle cell anemia, cystic fibrosis, uh, fragile X, um, some of these autosomal dominant ones like neurofibromatosis, uh, myotonic dystrophy. You know, those are ones that are known to a lot of people. For geneticists, they know a lot more. But most people, uh, when, you know, when this list gets exhausted, uh, it's rare that people have heard a lot of a lot of these monogenic disorders. And you can see by the number of births affected that the numbers are fairly low. The diseases that affect most people are these so-called common complex diseases. Um, so this is actually uh, uh, causes of death data. And um, causes of death doesn't always reflect the morbidity in the population, but just as a rough guide, um, about a third of the people 
or a little more than a quarter of people die from heart disease or cancer, um, and then followed by uh, strokes, uh, respiratory infections, accidents um, is higher than I thought it would ever be, and things like diabetes. So, you know, these are the kinds of diseases that, that affect most people, and they also have a genetic component. Um, but we might expect that, uh, you know, since they're not due to one single gene, that maybe there's many variants, and each one of those variants has a small effect on the disease, and if you get a mutation here, 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 and here, then those things add up to give you cardiovascular disease, or at least that's one hypothesis that can be tested. So let's talk about some common variants. When I say that there might be common variants that cumulatively contribute to the disease. So the most common type of genetic variation or genetic difference between people are these single nucleotide polymorphisms. And all that is is that, you know, if you're going along in someone's genome, occasionally uh, someone will have a C in this position and somebody else will have a G. And then, you know, everything will be identical, 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 and then like over here, someone will have an A and someone will have a G. Those are single nucleotide polymorphisms. We call them polymorphisms because if you look at a large population, you see that some people have an A and some people have a G. Usually it's just a choice of two different bases. So on average, there's about one base pair different about every 300 base pairs in the genome. So it's still a lot of bases difference. And some of them have effects and some of them don't. So this is another look at some SNPs, as we call them. This is a, um, a depiction of a gene. This is actually the BRCA1 gene, which is a gene that's involved in breast cancer. And uh, without getting too technical, I'll just say that um, the, in this uh, diagram of the gene, um, the yellow boxes are coding regions. Those are parts that actually code for the BRCA1 protein. These uh, horizontal lines connecting these, and actually all of these vertical lines are yellow boxes. It's just they're so small that you can't see the yellow. But if you were zooming in, you'd see that actually all these vertical lines are, are protein coding regions. The parts between them are not protein coding regions, and they don't get incorporated into the final protein. Those are called introns. And uh, you can see that the part that actually makes the protein is only a small part of that whole genetic sequence. Most of the genetic sequence doesn't code for protein, and that's true throughout the genome. But the SNPs, so these are some SNPs up here. So, you know, somewhere over here, somebody has a G, somebody has an A uh, over here. I mean, they're kind of overlapping now, but like out here, you can see someone has a C, someone has a T. Um, and they fall into these coding regions. They also fall into regions that don't code for protein. So when I teach this in class, you know, one of my favorite questions to ask my students is, you know, give me five ways that a SNP can ex change gene expression. And, you know, they, if they land in a coding region, they can alter the protein's structure or its function. They can in insert a wrong amino acid. They could truncate it. They could have an effect in a non-coding region that maybe is involved in regulating the gene. So there's a number of ways that even changing a single base can actually lead to disease. But many of them don't lead to any disease. Um, it's not only SNPs that are genetic variants. That's the most common one, but there's lots of others. So there's uh, you know, small insertions or deletions. Um, and other things like substitutions and inversions. This is also a, a very common one that geneticists focus on is the copy number variants. So in this example, uh, this region is duplicated here. Now this is just a few bases as an illustration. Usually they're talking about thousands of bases that are duplicated somewhere else or deleted somewhere else. So. Uh, Things like cancer, you often see regions that are duplicated and regions that are dropped out. But the copy number variants that I'm talking about are ones that are actually inherited. So it's a little weird idea. So there could be entire genes where in some people, they might have five copies of this gene from the mother and two copies of this gene from the father. And you know, then they pass that on to their kids. So those are copy number variants where actually the number of genes or segments within the genes or something like that is passed on, is inherited on. 
And the frequencies of these common variants can be different in different populations. So uh, I would just say, so you know, this is a zoom in on that, that map that I showed you before, BRCA1. This is that big yellow co uh, co protein coding region. This is another one that now you can see it is actually yellow in there. And here's some SNPs that occur in that protein coding region. So you could see like uh, here, um, if you were looking at the DNA sequence, some people would have a C and some people would have a T. And according to this graph, most people have a C. But you can see like an example over here um, where in this case, uh, these three populations, this is a European population, a Chinese population, and a Japanese population. Most people in that population had an A, and only some of them had a C. But if we look at this African population out here, uh, most of the people had a C, and only a few people had, had the A. So this is another case like that, too. This is within the coding region. So most, most of this African population had a T. Now, does that mean that they're more susceptible to breast cancer or less susceptible to breast cancer? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But when you see this kind of data, now you can think to ask that question, right? In fact, these, uh, the fact that these SNP, SNPs have different uh, frequencies in different population allows um, 23andMe and others um, to actually use this information to look at ancestry. So one of the things that people can tell uh, when they look at your genetic information is something about your ancestry. And this is all, again, based on the fact that these SNPs appear at different frequencies. And of course, it also uh, affects uh, different populations when you're trying to study their, their medical history as well. Different populations will have different susceptibilities to different diseases, and in part, that's because of the specific genetics of those populations. So another way to apply the SNP information, a more useful way uh, than just looking at ancestry, uh, is to see if there's associations between different SNP patterns and disease. So this was one study that was done at the time, in 2007, it was considered to be the largest study of its type. Now, we would probably consider it to be underpowered for what it was trying to look at. But um, they started out looking at 500,000 SNPs across all the chromosomes in the genome. And they uh, looked at, uh, I think, uh, seven different diseases and uh, 2,000 people with the disease and 3,000 controls that didn't have the disease. And they said, do we see any SNP patterns that show up that uh, are more common in the, the people that have the disease and less common in the control group? And so uh, without being a genomicist, I could just say these are all the different chromosomes in the genome. And uh, the height of this bar represents the, the probability of the association. And what you could see is that for most of the SNPs, um, there's not much going on. And then suddenly, you get a signal right over here uh, at the short arm of chromosome 9, where there seems to be a lot of SNPs that have something to do with this disease, that they identified a particular pattern. And when that pattern is present, it's more likely that people will have coronary artery disease than, um, than people that don't have that pattern. Now, it turns out it's not a lot more likely, but it's a little bit more likely, and it's measurable and reproducible. So these are the so-called genome-wide association studies. And this was a very popular thing to do. It kind of peaked around 2007. And it's all because we suddenly had the technology to be able to ask the questions on a, on a scale of, like, thousands of people. You know, what are 500,000 SNPs and 10,000 people? Before, it wasn't possible to ask that question. But then uh, the technology allowed us to do that. So by last year, um, there's been more than uh, almost 1,500 of these GWAS studies published. And they've identified over 2,000 loci that are somehow linked to different kinds of conditions. Um, but the real message to come out of all of this is that it didn't really account for the common complex diseases the way that we had thought that they might. I wouldn't say it was a failure. I would say that it was a hypothesis that was tested. Um, but most of the SNPs that we saw uh, had a, only a very small effect on disease. And most of them were, were very 
common, and again, as I suggested to you before, if they're, the more common that you find them in the population, the less likely they are to affect disease to a, a significant amount. So there's only a few examples that came out of all of these studies where there were uh, common variants, common SNPs, that had a large effect size. Um, and one of these is uh, an age-related macular degeneration, and the other is in Alzheimer's. And I'm going to talk about uh, the Alzheimer's one a little bit later. Um, so as far as complex disease goes, um, only a small portion of the inherited risk has been revealed through these kinds of analyses. Now, remember, they didn't look at everything in the genome. They only looked at common SNPs. Uh, so, you know, that was the technology that they could look at at the time. Uh, it was still too expensive to look at, like, a complete genome of 10,000 people. So uh, they only looked at SNPs. But, you know, if we look at that, and, you know, this is a, a, a chart from a paper that came out just last year in Nature. Um, here's the uh, age-related macular degeneration. This is the kind of situation that you would like genetics to be in. Uh, they, there were three different loci that seemed to be associated with the disease that came out of these GWAS studies. And those three loci, depending on what their status was, could account for about 50 percent of the inherited information, the heritable genetic information that we know is out there. So that's not bad. It doesn't account for everything, but it accounts for about half. You could explain half of the disease by looking at these three locations in the genome, and it could tell you something about macular degeneration. On the other extreme, we have something like height. Now, height, I think, was known for a long time to have a strong genetic component. In fact, you know, it's been known that if you have, if you come from tall parents, it's very likely that you will be a tall person. If you come from short parents, it's likely you'll be a short person. So we know there's an inherited component to height. But the GWAS studies have identified already 180 different loci, different regions around the genome that seem to have some influence on height, and yet that explains only 12 percent of the inherited component of height. So how many more genes are there in the genome that we have to understand before we understand how height is related to genetics? Um, and actually, a lot of the complex diseases are in this kind of category, where there's been a number of, uh, of loci that have been identified. Usually, they don't affect the disease very much. So they have some effect, but not a lot. And, and there's still a lot of genetics that's still out there, but we don't know what it is. And needless to say, from this, it's very hard to predict risk, because on top of all of this, we're only talking about the heritable component of the disease and there's still a large environmental component as well. So now it's thought, at least for the genetic component, for complex diseases, it's probably a mixture of these common variants, like SNPs, and rare variants, um, where maybe you know somebody has a mutation in this gene, and another person has a mutation in that gene. But when you look genome-wide, you don't see it, because you don't know that this mutation is directly linked to their disease. So finding rare variants with a large effect is going to be very difficult. And this is kind of the state of the art for where uh, genomics is now with regards to medicine. This is like the, the new frontier, is we've looked at the common variation that was very hard to look at before, then it became easy to look at, and we looked at it, and it turned out, well, you know, it's not having a very large effect. But, you know, if you, if, if you knew all the pathway information, and a lot of this is becoming clearer now, and you had a patient that had a mutation here, and another one that had a mutation here, and another that had a mutation here. Individually, you'd say, well, I have no idea if this mutation is, due, is related to their disease. I don't know if it's causative. But if you could somehow put, you know, map those onto these pathways or onto some kind of a gene network, suddenly you could say, oh, yeah, actually, they're all in the same pathway. They could be causative of this disease. So, it's all getting more complicated. It's not just the genetics. The analysis now is going to be very complicated and involve a lot of information. So to summarize the first part of, of this talk, um, there are single gene disorders uh, that are, of course, devastating to the people affected by them, but actually affect relatively few people. 
These disorders are characterized usually by rare variants that have a large effect. They're easy to find and, and therefore they're easy to test for. Um, but the kinds of uh, disorders that affect most people are the complex disorders that are more complicated. Um, there's uh, often genetic and environmental risk factors that contribute to the disease. We can only look at the genetic ones on the DNA. Um, there's probably a combination of common and rare variants that are involved. These variants are often hard to find, and so they're not easy to test for. If there is a test, it's not always clear what that means for, your, for the individual's personal risk. So it's hard to know how predictive they are of whether the person's gonna get a disease, and there's still that whole environmental component. Um, so if you knew your personal risk, how would it affect therapy? That's, that's also the big question. Um, so I guess what I'm leading up to, uh, which I'm gonna discuss in the next segment, is that we often talk about genetic information and how that's gonna affect healthcare. And uh, the, the topic that I wanna cover in the next segment is really that there's different kinds of genetic information, and some of it is useful and some of it is not useful. So how is genetic information used in medicine? So up to now, I've just been telling you about genomic information. That's information that's stored in the DNA. And uh, one of my colleagues at UC Davis likes to have this slide. Um, he says you know, that the genome is what could happen, right? Because we have 26,000 genes, and in any one cell, maybe only 10% of those genes are expressed. That's why a liver cell is different than a brain cell. So uh, this is what could happen, the transcriptome or the, the RNA level, uh, the epigenome, that's what appears to be happening. The proteome is all the proteins that are made from these uh, RNA, uh, messenger RNAs. Um, that's what makes it happen. And then what has happening and is happening, he, you could consider as the metabolome. So that's kind of what these enzymes might be acting on. Um, and this kind of pathway then contributes to the phenotype, which he says is why we care. I mean, I think he works on this level, so he has a kind of bias when he puts this slide together. But it does kind of illustrate that, you know, there is a, a kind of hierarchy of genomic information. So uh, you could consider all of this, in a sense, omics information, or some people just refer to it as genomic information, even though I usually just think of this as genomic information. But, but the... Uh, NCBI, uh, when they talk about a genetic test, um, they talk about the analysis of human DNA, RNA, chromosomes, proteins, and certain metabolites. So all of this, uh, to some people's opinion, is considered a genetic test. And so uh, I want to talk a little bit about some existing kind of genetic tests that are out there that are being used in medicine. And one of the one of the primary ones is having to do with pharmacogenetics, uh, which is basically how genetics affects the metabolism of certain drugs. And this has been known for a long time that uh, a lot of the drugs are modified by uh, certain um, uh, cytochrome enzymes. And these cytochrome enzymes are polymorphic. I don't know why, but different people have different versions, different genetic versions of these enzymes, and some of these enzymes work better than others. Um, I would imagine that humans would evolve to have all these things working uh, really well. So I don't know why some would work better than others, but that's, that's what we have. And you could actually look at this um, with a genetic screen, and you can look at the isoforms of these different uh, cytochromes, and you could actually make an estimate of whether somebody might metabolize a drug quickly or slowly, or whether they'd be an extensive metabolizer or a poor metabolizer of the drug. And in some cases, this information is actually already being used to try to make predictions about uh, levels of drugs or what kinds of um, uh, dosage to start someone on. In many cases, you know, that might not matter for drugs. Uh, in some cases, like antidepressants and other kinds of things, antipsychotics, um, where sometimes dosing is, is, uh, is difficult, this kind of information might be useful. 
These are some other drugs where um, there's actually uh, biomarkers, genetic biomarkers that are used for these drugs. These are just two examples from a whole list of drugs um, from this FDA website. And so, you know, this is a, a statin. The top one is a statin drug. And uh, they're suggesting that uh, the dosage could be adjusted based on uh, a genetic test. And warfarin, of course, is another one that uh, I don't know how many people actually use genetic tests to, to uh, get the warfarin dose right, or or if they just you know kind of try to feel it out. But certainly, there's a lot of genetic tests available to be able to dose warfarin, and because its action is very dependent on on these uh, cytochrome enzymes and what isoform you have. Here's some other. Uh, mostly uh, antibody-based drugs, anti-cancer drugs. Um, and a lot of these require a genetic test. So for example, um, Herceptin, I think it's that one, I can't see too well. Um, it's, only, it's only useful on breast cancers that are HER2 positive. And so if it's not a HER2 positive breast cancer tumor, then that, that drug is not indicated. And so this is the kind of genetic test that can be used to make a, a therapeutic decision. Now again, when I say genetic or genetic test, they call it a genetic test, but the test is actually immunohistochemistry or uh, fluorescence in C2 hybridization. So not like a DNA test, because actually a DNA test, you know, the person would probably have the gene, but it might not be expressed in that tumor. So knowing the genotype doesn't tell you enough. You have to look at actually what's going on. So the same uh, NCBI website, this gene test website, which is a wealth of information, this is their list of what they say uh, is the purpose of genetic information in healthcare. And I know that this table is too hard to read, but I just want to highlight some of these things. So the top category is for diagnosis, and they give examples like neurofibromatosis, um, and some other, other single gene disorders uh, where uh, molecular tests could identify a genetic condition. So, I mean, I think that's a very obvious kind of um, use of this information in, uh, in healthcare. Um, that goes along with uh, newborn screening, which again, you know, I would say is a kind of diagnostic test as well. Um, and they list things like cystic fibrosis or sickle cell disease. I mean, these are opportunities to screen people where there might be a, a, something that you might do as an intervention that you'd want to start early on. So for newborn screening, typically these are things that involve uh, uh, either birth defects or metabolic errors, uh, meta metabolic deficiencies, things that you know, there would be a therapy for. Uh, carrier testing is another use of genetics that I think is applied fairly widely if the family history indicates it. And so they list things like uh, muscular dystrophy, Tay-Sachs, cystic fibrosis. That's a kind of pre-pregnancy uh, pre decision that you can make based on a carrier test. Even 23andMe offers their carrier tests of a battery of different um, diseases. And there's also prenatal tests uh, that that can be done after pregnancy, um, and they list things like Down syndrome. Um, then it gets to be a little bit more murky down here, prediction of future risk. So we talked a little bit about uh, tests to predict drug response. I think that's certainly uh, something that's useful for medicine. Um, then there's tests for adult onset genetic conditions. And these are things like Huntington's disease. Um, and again, you know, there, there's, there gets to be ethical questions about this. You know, you could test for Huntington's disease in a young person, and you could see the genetic variation that would lead to Huntington's disease. But if you can't actually do anything about that, what is the value of that information other than to create a burden for the person? And you know, this kind of question is, is going to come up more and more. And, and I, I would just, all I would say about that is, you know, today that's something that we in this room should all think about. But in reality, uh, people will have a lot of access to their genetic information in the future. And it's not going to come down to a bioethicist somewhere whether they should get this test or not. 
So I think we need to think a little bit differently as a society about what we're going to do about this information because the genie is coming out of the bottle. Um, another area is that I talked about already is this uh, assessment of genetic risk, things like colorectal cancer, coronary heart disease. These are, these are conditions where you can look at some genetic variation today anyway, but what that actually says in terms of risk is not completely clear. So I like to break the genetic information down into three categories, or maybe four, of information that is actionable, information that is just deterministic, information that's probabilistic, and then uh, of unknown clinical significance. So let's talk about actionable information. So these are things like the neonatal testing, and this is a graph of just the number of genetic tests for which testing is available, and by now it's over 2,000 different uh, genetic tests. Most of these are monogenic disorders, and, um, and many states uh, require newborns to be screened for 10 to 30 of these kinds of disorders. So clinically useful? Yes, it's clinically useful. Those are usually single gene disorders, of course. Now here's another one, and I could teach a whole class on, on just uh, BRCA1 and the breast cancer test. So I'll try to be quick about it. Um, if you were to get uh, a BRCA1 and BRCA2 uh, breast cancer test, this is what you'd be confronted with. Um, so typically people would be uh, um, suggested to, to take this genetic test if there was a family history that indicated that they might be at risk of having breast cancer in their family, then they might be uh, suggested to get this test. And uh, the first thing that they would want to know is if you're of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, because that population, as we saw before with the SNPs, where there's certain patterns that show up in certain populations, in this Ashkenazi Jewish population that's been well studied, there are three primary types of mutations that are known to be highly linked to breast cancer, to the familial form of breast cancer. So if you have Ashkenazi Jewish descent, the first thing they would do is sequence these regions to see if you have any of those three main mutations. If you don't, or if you're not of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, um, they would then sequence both BRCA1 and BRCA2, um, and they sequence the entire genes there. That's their comprehensive analysis. And what they do with that information, um, so if you're of Ashkenazi Jewish descent and someone in your family had breast cancer under the age of 50 uh, in one relative but no ovarian cancer in any relative, um, the likelihood that you would have breast cancer over the age of 40 or over the age of 50 would be something like 9.4%. But if you're not of Ashkenazi Jewish descent and um, uh, someone in your family had ovarian cancer in more than one relative, but no breast cancer under 50 in any relative, then, I don't know, you know, your risk of having breast cancer over 50 and ovarian cancer at any age would be something like 46.2%. All I want to try to impart from this is that it's complicated, okay? It's complicated, you know, uh, the variants are, are rare. Um, it depends a lot on your, your family history, so even the genetic events by themselves are not completely predictive. Even when they are predictive, you get some kind of uh, assessment of your relative risk. I mean, is a 10% increased relative risk something that you would take action on? And if so, what action would you take? Um, and then we have to consider that only 5 to 10% of breast cancer is this hereditary familial type. So. Uh, even someone that didn't have these mutations coming from this test would not be safe. They would just default to the, uh, to the baseline kind of uh, um, breast cancer incidence, which is about one in eight. Um, it's recommended to test if there's a family history of breast cancer. So if you already know there's a family history of breast cancer, is that actionable enough? Or what else does this genetic test give? That's an important question. This, I, I, I found this when I was preparing this a few years ago. I haven't found this statement in their current information, but this was from Myriad Genetics that makes this test. The risk of developing cancer that is associated with BRCA1 and BRCA2 is not known. So 
that's confusing to me in a breast cancer test. Um, and then they don't recommend it for women under 18 years of age because they say for those women of, of that, in that age group, they don't actually recommend any, any changes in lifestyle or therapy. So, uh, so they actually don't recommend them to get it. But again, you know, who's controlling that decision? But the main question that I would have is, is this, is this information actionable? Let's say you show up with this test, you have some kind of a high likelihood of developing breast cancer from this, um, what would you do about it? And, you know, they, um, this is what they had on their web page. Um, so they say things like, well, you could have targeted increased surveillance. That's good. Um, that you know, with earlier diagnosis, you could have reduced medical costs and improved outcomes. Yeah, that will come from the increased surveillance. Uh, you can counsel other patients and family members um, that they might be at risk, although that's not really a, a therapy. Um, and they say you can avoid unnecessary interventions. That could be true. Uh, but you know, it's a it's a it's a question. You know, what what would you do with this information when you had it? Um, that would be more than you would know, you know, just by having a family history. Now, not every genetic test has these conundrums surrounding it, but it's a good example of the kinds of issues of a genetic test that, uh, you know, gives you some information, but that information is complicated. These are some other uh, what I would call actionable uh, genetic information tests. So, um, for example, just this one is an example. Um, is about cardiac disease, and in this one, they, they actually screen 100 genes. So they get the sequence of 100 genes, not just two, like BRCA1 and 2. They look at 100 genes of different panels, and from all of that information, they make some kind of a, a risk assessment of, uh, of cardiac disease. And these are assembled by uh, groups that try to look at just the information that might affect therapy. So there are some tests out there like that. So uh, how, how is it that we can look at just 100 genes in our entire genome? Don't we have to sequence the whole thing, starting with chromosome 1 and going all the way through? Um, well, without going into too much technical detail, let's just say that there are ways that you can pull out those genetic sequences that you're interested in and just sequence those. So they make some kinds of probes that have a similar DNA sequence to the things they're interested in. You can chop up the DNA into little pieces and mix it with these probes in a certain way so that the probes just pull out these pieces that you're interested in and the rest of it you don't need to look at. And um, that's how they look at just 100 genes and sequence just 100 genes out of the 26,000 genes that we have. They can also look at all 180,000 exons. And that's important because, um, as I might have mentioned earlier, um, only about 2% of the genome actually codes for protein. Most of the DNA that's in the genome doesn't actually code for protein. It doesn't lead to the production of, of protein. It may have some regulatory function. A lot of it is repetitive elements. Most of the DNA is actually repetitive sequences. Some of the function we know, a lot of the functions we don't know. But if you were to sequence the entire human genome, uh, probably 98% of it is, is things that are not, not that interesting uh, to you, at least today. So if you just sequence um, these, these yellow boxes, those are the exons, the ones that code for protein. This is called whole exome sequencing. Okay, and again, it's, it's saving 90, 98% of the cost of sequencing because you just sequence that little bit that you're interested in. And then instead of looking at a, 100 complete genes or two complete genes, you look at all the genes, all the protein coding regions in the genome. And this is now also you know, being widely used and has been shown to be useful for a clinical diagnosis in some cases. So um, this was one of the early papers in 2009 where they used a whole exome capture and sequencing to make a genetic diagnosis. Uh, and there's lots of papers that have come out since, you know, where they talk about um, 
different kinds of diagnoses, uh, clinical diagnoses through the use of whole exome sequencing. Now, whole exome sequencing is something that's kind of modern, so let's say this is kind of where things are now because uh, it gives you a lot of information and uh, particularly for monogenic disorders, uh, you can just look at the coding regions and most of the time mutations or, or you know, whatever is disrupting that gene will show up in the whole exome sequencing. So I work with uh, clinical geneticists at UC Davis uh, in the MIND Institute and you know, oftentimes if the geneticist uh, has you know, used the gold standard test, what they think is going on and that's unrevealing or they don't even know what genetic tests to do, uh, you know, more and more they want to turn to whole exome sequencing to try to look at all the exomes, see anywhere where there's a mutation and maybe you know, if you look, especially at trios, where you look at the child and the, and, the, and the parents, from that kind of information, it does give you a lot of information about what might be the mutation that's causative and what the condition might be. Now, exome sequencing is relatively cheap. Um, this, again, is an example from this BGI group. They offer about $1,000. They'll give you uh, a whole exome sequence. This has the bioinformatics attached to it, so uh, um, it's, it's a pretty cheap price. So, you know, this kind of thing could be uh, done routinely, right? It wouldn't be very expensive. However, uh, this is not something that can be done with patients. Um, for patient samples, uh, they need to go through some certifi certified procedures. And uh, for genome sequencing, that falls under CLIA, the Clinical Laboratories Improvement Amendments. And uh, CLIA basically looks at these kinds of things, personnel standards, quality assurance, quality control, analytical validity. Um, and basically, you know, trying to validate that when an answer comes back from sequencing, this is clinically valid information. So uh, to get CLIA-rated sequencing is more expensive, so you can't do a whole exome for CLIA-rated sequencing. And then, of course, more than CLIA would be CAP, the College of American Pathologists, and this is, this is considered to be a higher quality standard than CLIA alone. Um, yeah, so it exceeds CLIA requirements. And again, you know, they, they, they uh, hold the uh, practitioners accountable for a number of, of different parameters. So uh, for any patient samples where information will actually be used to inform clinical decisions or be returned to the patient, they need to be CLIA sequenced at least and preferably uh, with CAP certification. So here's an example where Baylor College of Medicine was announcing that they were doing whole exome sequencing clinical tests, and they were announcing it at a, at a cost of about $9,000 per sample. Now, Ambry Genetics will, will also do whole exome sequencing, CLIA certified, uh, for about uh, $5,000 for an individual. Of course, they prefer to do a trio because that's more uh, uh, informative for about $14,000. But again, you know, let's compare this test, okay, of one individual for about $5,000, you get the sequence of every protein coding region in their genome. Myriad Genetics BRCA1 and BAC2 test, they test two genes, cost $3,000. You can get all 26,000 genes done for just a little bit more. That's kind of where we are with that. Now, it's interesting, Ambry Genetics, specifically when you do their whole exome sequence, they need to redact these genes from that, that output because Myriad has patents on that. And the patent issue, I mean, this is a whole other issue, right? There's like the, the medical scientific issues, there's the ethical issues, and then we have this le legal layer too. And I don't even have time to go into that. I, I could talk about that a lot. but. Um, Let's just say uh, Myriad's been sued, they lost, they appealed, they won, and then it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court, I think, said uh, go back to the lower courts. So I don't think we've heard the end of this, but, um, but again, the ability, the ability to get this information is becoming easier and easier and easier, and soon these kinds of guys won't be able to really control it anymore. So where are we today? Um, groups like Complete Genomics, all they do is sequence whole human genomes. So that their whole business model is sequencing whole human genomes. 
And if you want to get beyond just the exome, you want to get the whole genome done, they can do it now for about five, four to five thousand dollars per person. Um, it gives you more information, you know, in cases where there's, you know, you're looking at the probabilistic information now that's often outside of exomes, it gets into gene regulation, regions like that. This kind of service would be useful. You can see it's more expensive. Unfortunately, it's not CLIA rated. So to get a CLIA whole genome sequence, I don't know what the price is, but it would be very expensive. It would be, you know, certainly more than $10,000. So right now, whole genome sequencing with CLIA rating uh, is not really uh, cost effective. Um, interesting, 23andMe, and I, by the way, I have nothing to do with 23andMe, okay? I just keep referring to them because, you know, they're kind of this, uh, this entity that keeps coming up, you know, that you know, you'd like to try to avoid this. but. You know, all the medical students want to be tested with 23andMe. You know, I keep running into people every time I give a lecture, uh, somebody has already enrolled in 23andMe. So, I mean, you just can't, like, pretend that they don't exist because a lot of people are getting their information here. Um, and actually, they are CLIA certified. <laughs> they are CLIA certified. And their test is only $207, right? So, I mean, you can, you can imagine that, um, more, these guys might actually accrue more genetic information with their direct-to-consumer service, with their slick interface and their user-friendly attitude um, <laughs> than any kind of, you know, clinical study, you know, that has all these different layers and expenses and, and ethics. So I'm not saying they're not ethical. Okay, let's not get into that. Um, but the probabilistic genetic information, okay, as I said, it's complicated. So Lynn Jordy now, who is the president of the American Society of Human Genetics, um, wrote this article and said, you know, we need to educate our, our medical community about probabilistic genetic information and what it really means. And I hear that message, but I don't really know what to say. There are some uh, genes which uh, clearly have a large influence on the outcome of the disease, large effect size. So, you know, if you have mutations in this APC gene, your risk of getting colon cancer is pretty high. Um, the example that they give here, this gene for type 2 diabetes, if you have the risk alleles, the risk variants in your genome, they say you have a 50% increased relative risk. And what the point they're trying to make with this graph is, um, that's only a slight increase in the absolute risk of getting the disease. So it sounds like, oh, you know, you have twice as much chance of getting the disease. Yeah, you get twice as much as you had before, but it's not that much. So this information is complicated. I think it's complicated for clinicians. It's complicated for researchers. It's complicated now. So do people even want to know? Do we want people to know? And do people want to know? So I just, uh, these are some slides from Robert Green at Harvard Medical School that, um, I just want to say these are all his slides, but uh, they, they give a great message. So this is the APOE um, allele and, uh, and certain variants of the APOE gene. Um, if you have these certain variants, you have a very high risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so this, you can make a genetic test for the risk of Alzheimer's disease, and uh, it has very good analytical validity. It has well-documented clinical val validity. There's no treatment that you could change from this information currently. Uh, it's a terrifying disease that, you know, you would not like anyone to have. Um, so the question is, would people like to know their risk? So they actually did a study. Well, so first, um, he showed all the articles where bioethicists chimed in saying, this is a textbook case where we should not be testing because if you have an answer that would condemn someone to getting a disease and there's nothing you can do about it, you have done no good, you can only do harm, right? So they went ahead and they, they tested people in this trial and uh, some of them had this, uh, this bad um, uh, genetic variants and some of them did not and some of them they didn't give the information back. And then they gave them some kind of a, a anxiety test uh, several months after the information was given back. And they concluded that, at least by this test, uh, the people that had a positive outcome, maybe I should say a bad outcome, 
um, were not more anxious than, than the other groups of people. When they asked them who would do the risk assessment again, uh, almost everyone said yes. Everyone wanted to do it again. Some of the people would pay uh, $500 or more to have a genetic test like this. Um, and uh, in terms of what the outcomes were, uh, if they weren't increased anxiety, what did happen? So some people that were found to be at risk for Alzheimer's disease uh, decided to take on healthy behavioral changes in terms of eating vitamins, exercise, and, and some medications. The other thing that they did is many people in that category that were positive uh, decided to take out more long-term coverage on their health insurance. <laughs> so I just want to end this segment um, to talk a little bit about health insurance. So uh, I gave this similar kind of talk in Japan to a group of, uh, of students. And you know, I went through a series of exercises, and I talked about you know the information in the genome and how it's used in, in medicine. And uh, I ended with a series of exercises. And one of the exercises is you know like would you test this person and what's the benefit? And the last one was, um, you know, do you think your health insurance company should have access to this information? And they were completely silent, and they didn't know what to say because of course they don't have health insurance companies like that. And finally, someone stood up and said, of course they shouldn't have this information. Why would they? And I thought, wow, <laughs> that's, a, that's a different way of, of looking at things. But in this country, yes, we have uh, health insurance uh, companies that, um, that discriminate against people. Hopefully, uh, that's going to change under the new, um, the new health care law. But, uh, but let's see how that goes. In the meantime, before that happens, uh, President Bush signed the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act in 2008. I thought it was interesting. The bill had passed the Senate and the House uh, by a vote of 414 to 1. So I don't know who that guy is, but I would post his genome on the internet. So what does GINA do? What does this Genetic Non-Discrimination Act do? Uh, it prohibits discrimination in health coverage by employers. Um, it prohibits, uh, prohibits health insurers and health plan administrators from requiring uh, genetic information. And it also prohibits most employers uh, from using genetic information for hiring, firing, promotion decisions, and for decisions regarding terms of employment. But what are things that GINA will not do? Uh, it doesn't uh, give non-discrimination protection against life insurance or, or disability insurance or long-term care insurance. <clears throat> um, it doesn't employ, apply to employers with fewer than 15 employees. And then this one that I'm still trying to figure out, um, GINA does not prohibit health insurance or health plan administrators from obtaining or using genetic test results in making health insurance payment determinations. I guess that's just saying that you still have to pay whatever your genetics are. But, um, but you know, GINA will give you some level of, of protection. And I don't know uh, how many times this has been needed or challenged. Um, other studies have suggested that you know, this was a big fear that all the insurance companies would suddenly genotype everyone and decide who they were going to cover or not. Uh, that never really happened, even before the law. But, uh, but certainly, this gives us some protections now. And as I say, um, the new, uh, new health care laws may give us other protections as well. So to summarize this part of the talk, um, Genetic, a, a genetic test can uh, be either genomic information or any other ohm, like the transcriptome or the proteome or the metabolome. Um, CLIA and CAP certification is required before any information can be used in clinical care. Uh, genomic information, such as pharmacogenomics, uh, Mendelian disorders, cancer mutations, all of these things have been shown to be clinically useful and actionable. You know, there are some examples, and I, I didn't show any specific ones today, but there are some examples where, depending on the, the cancer mutation that somebody has, you would choose one drug over the other. 
So that's actionable information. In other cases, this information is just deterministic, meaning that there's a very high likelihood that the person would develop the disease, but there's not much you can do about it. And so, again, there's some ethical questions about what you would do with this information and who's making those decisions. Then there's probabilistic genomic, genomic information that's harder to interpret and harder to make predictions about what that does to the person's health. Something I didn't talk a, a little bit about, probably shouldn't be in the summary then, is the incidentalome, the, what, they, what they're calling the incidentalome. So it's known that every genome carries two or more deleterious mutations. Those are mutations that probably would lead to some kind of uh, genetic health condition. So what that means is, you know, if you have a patient that you uh, are looking, you know, for some condition related to lung disease, and you find that they have some mutation that impact, that is known to impact their mental health, what are your obligations under those, in that situation? Are you obligated to tell them about this mutation affecting their mental health, or is that not, not your part? You know, uh, these are the kinds of ethical questions that are coming up now. When I was at um, you know meetings before, uh, this was this was the main focus of the discussion was the ethics of this and and the ethics of the incidentalome, because uh, they say that if you look in anyone's genome, you'll find something, and what you do with that information is is an important question. Um, many people will want to know despite the risks or whatever risks there might be, that's a good question. And, uh, and supposedly, Gina will protect you from abusers. So, in the last part of the talk, um, this last segment, um, I'm gonna uh, not talk about genetic information per se, but now talk about some ways that you think about deterministic information and how you might actually use that more as therapy. So some of this determinant inf information can already inform clinical decisions, right? So we mentioned that before. Uh, that would be these actionable items. The other things, like I said, you can test for it, you can find out about it, but there's nothing you can do about it. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna close off talking a little bit about gene therapy and particularly what we're doing with gene therapy. And I'm just suggesting that you know, this is one avenue for turning deterministic information into a therapy. And the example I'm going to talk about is Angelman syndrome. So Angelman syndrome may be somewhat familiar to most people in this audience. It's a neurologic disorder. The phenotype is characterized by, uh, largely by, a, as a profound learning disorder. Um, for example, uh, affected children never develop language, language beyond a few words. Uh, uh, clinically, um, the lesion, the primary lesion seems to be uh, a defect in synaptic plasticity. So uh, that uh, accounts for the, the learning problems that they have. And there's, you know, other very common uh, phenotypes like a happy disposition, uh, the, characteristic hand movements that they have, very hyperactive. They don't sleep much, they keep their parents up. Um, and a lot of them also suffer from seizures, which I'm not exactly sure, or I think we're all not really sure exactly what part that comes from. On a genetic level, um, the genetics of Angelman syndrome are very fascinating, and it's made Angelman syndrome a kind of textbook example of an imprinting disorder. So many students learn about Angelman syndrome in class. But because it doesn't affect a lot of people, there aren't actually that many people working on, on treatment for Angelman syndrome, as it turns out. So let me just say that um, this region is unusual. Uh, in most, most parts of the genome, uh, we have you know, a, gene, uh, a chromosome that came from mom and a chromosome that came from dad. They have the same genes on them. And in most cases, both genes, the genes from both chromosomes are expressed. So we usually have two, you know, copies that are on. In this particular region on chromosome 15, uh, for some reason, um, on the paternal copy, the, the chromosome that came from, from the dad, uh, only these blue genes are on, and these genes are off. Actually, these ones are, are on in both cases. 
but these genes are off. And on the maternal chromosome, you have the opposite pattern. All these genes are off, and these genes are on. So this is called imprinting by parent of origin. So uh, whoever the, the mother inherited her chromosomes from, whether she passes on the chromosome that came from her father or she passes on the chromosome that came from her mother, when she gives that, that chromosome to her, her son or daughter, uh, these genes will now become inactive, and these two will be active. So this is the imprinting mechanism, and parts of it are understood and parts of it are not. But this is the kind of situation that we have. And what that means is that these genes are only expressed on the maternal chromosome. These ones are expressed on the paternal chromosome. And Angelman syndrome usually results from mutations or usually a big deletion of this whole region. Now again, in other parts of the body, um, you know, all the genes would be on, so you would lose a, two copy, you would lose a copy of the gene, which sometimes is bad, but you might have one copy that's still working. In this case, when this goes, uh, there is a copy of the gene. It's actually a, an intact gene uh, that doesn't, that's not mutated in any way, but it's silenced. It's epigenetically silenced. And actually, the mechanism of epigenetic silencing in this case is a large uh, RNA transcript that starts somewhere over here, and it, it plows through this coding region over here. And in some way, that again is not completely clear, um, that makes this gene silent. So uh, from this and from a lot of other information, we know that the, the problem with this disease is the loss of this gene UBE3A. So there's no UB, and, and by the way, this only happens in neurons, uh, mature neurons in the brain. It doesn't happen in any other cell of the body. Go figure. So only in the brain, you have no UBE3A expression, and somehow that leads to this Angelman syndrome condition, to this problem in synaptic plasticity. The details of that we're still trying to understand. It's complicated, but... Uh, it's the privilege of the gene therapist that we don't have to really understand what the protein is doing. Because we think that if you could just replace the, the mutant gene, um, somehow everything will get better from that. I don't know if that's completely true, but, um, but to a first approximation, that's how gene therapists uh, approach it. So the therapeutic goal in this case is to try to reactivate this UBE3A gene. Now, how would you actually do that? Well, probably the best way would be through a drug treatment. And I say that, I don't know if drugs are the best, uh, the best tool in medicine. Um, I don't know if drugs actually cure people of anything. Uh, you know, if it's an antibiotic and there's an infection, you know, maybe those drugs are curative. A lot of the other drugs we have often are, are treating symptoms. So I'm not, you know, I think the, the good thing about drugs is that uh, you know, we, they're the devil that we know. We know a lot about drugs. Uh, we know about how to make drugs. Um, we know something about how to make drugs. And we know uh, we have systems in place you know, for, for producing drugs and testing them. So if we could use a drug, uh, <clears throat> that would probably be the best thing. And in the past, I would have said, I don't know of any drug that can activate a specific gene. Uh, maybe there are, there are some. But, uh, but in general, you know, it's difficult to design a drug to activate a specific gene. You might find one. So in this case, uh, Ben Philpott uh, did a drug screen where they screened a bunch of different kinds of drugs. And, uh, and they actually found a drug uh, or a class of drugs that could activate this UBE3A gene. Um, in, in, uh, in neurons and cell culture and also in a mouse model of the disease. And this was kind of a surprise. These were actually topoisomerase inhibitors, which is actually a, a widely used anti-cancer drug. Um, and I don't know if it activates just this gene. It probably activates, um, now that we're learning a little bit more about the mechanism, it, we expect it might actually be activating other kinds of genes, not just the specific gene. But it was a surprise to a lot of people, which is why it was published in Nature, that this drug was reactivating this epigenetically silenced gene. And it was activating it to a pretty high level. Again, without knowing anything about how these assays are done or what they mean, you can see that this uh, mock-treated one is 
is dark, and this one treated with the drug is light, uh, glowing green. And that means that this, uh, that this gene was turned on in those uh, parts of the brain, the hippocampus. So that was very promising. This just came out this year and you know, sent a big shockwave through the whole community um, about the possibilities. Uh, however, uh, drugs do have you know, several disadvantages. Um, many drugs don't go across the blood-brain barrier. Certainly many of them do, but this is not one of them. So uh, delivery of this drug was okay in the research study, but when thinking about how you deliver that therapeutically, it gets more complicated for a drug that doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. Maybe some clever medicinal chemist can fix that problem. Um, there's also questions about toxicity, and, and you know, it's just at the beginning. To be fair to this drug, it's at the very beginning of its, of its uh, development. Um, but you know, certainly one concern a lot of people have is uh, topoisomerase inhibitors are often used as anti-cancer drugs, and their mechanism of action is to make strand breaks all over the, D, the DNA in the cell until essentially the cells give up and die. Now, that's not the kind of drug you would reach for first to treat young children with a mental disorder, in my opinion. I shouldn't say anything bad about it, right? I mean, this was a, this was a real breakthrough, so you know, it has a long way to go, as I say. And then there's more conventional gene therapy. So the conventional gene therapy is you have a mutated gene, let's take a good copy of that gene and put it into the person's DNA where it will stay and make that gene product and hopefully you know, everything will get better. And uh, this simple kind of you know, traditional gene therapy model has been difficult. Uh, you know, first tried in about 1990, and 20 years later, we still don't have any approved gene therapies in this country. Uh, it's been a very rocky road. I could talk for a long time about the history of gene therapy and its ups and downs, um, and the true believers and the many doubters. I, I'm a true believer. I think that uh, we're going to start to see gene therapies being FDA approved uh, sometime in the next few years. Um, I think the things that I see happening are very optimistic. But let's say the traditional gene therapy model is that you take you know, a healthy copy of this gene and stick it in the genome somewhere, uh, and, and that should replace the gene product, and hopefully that, that works. And this kind of thing was also tried in Angelman syndrome by Ed Weber, who uh, used uh, a virus called adeno-associated virus. So this is just one of the three main types of viruses that are used as a way to deliver the gene into the cell. And they're used mostly for historic reasons because we know that viruses do this as part of their normal life cycle. They take you know, nucleic acids and introduce them into cells. That's what makes us sick from the virus. Um, and so you know, we try to learn from that and, and usurp their capabilities for our own purposes. Uh, many people in the gene therapy community would, might suggest that you know, viruses as a tool for gene delivery um, might be considered as a kind of stepping stone. I mean, it's the best tool that we have today, but you could see that um, as we learn more about it and more about what's required, maybe you could actually uh, make things that are better than viruses and not have to rely on uh, taking over the function of these biological things, you could synthetically make things that maybe do the same thing. But right now, uh, in, in, in brain gene therapy, AAV is the vector of choice. And so he took a, a wild-type copy of the UBE3A gene and he put it into this AAV and then injected that into the brains of uh, Angelman syndrome mice. And again, um, you have untreated, wild-type, and then these are the treated mice. <clears throat> and you can see that there's some brown layer here around the hippocampus, and that's the uh, activation of the UBE3A that looks more like the wild-type mouse than the control mouse. Um, and you know, they were able to show in this publication that they were able to rescue some of the phenotypes, but the viral vectors also don't cross the blood-brain barrier, so they also face significant delivery problems. Uh, and they also face problems of biodistribution. So let's talk about the delivery. And, it, and biodistribution, I just mean when you do get it into the brain, it often tends to go to just a, a small place. So uh, this is work by some other people, 
that we're specifically looking at delivery of AAV into the brain. And so uh, these need to be injected directly through the skull into the brain. And they showed that, you know, when they injected this AAV vector, you know, they could get some staining of where the vector was going in the region of the brain that they were interested in. But you could see that there's large parts of the brain, you know, that were completely uh, untouched by this vector. So they did another, another experiment in this paper where they did uh, four different injections in different parts of the brain. And you could see that, you know, with that, they get a larger distribution, but they're still pretty much hitting one hemisphere of the brain. And there's regions of the brain, again, that never saw any virus. So this is on a mouse, too, uh, a, a kind of small mouse. So you could imagine if you were to propose this as a human therapy with a much larger brain, uh, it's problematic. Again, I don't want to like stand up here and knock everybody's uh, approach. Uh, I'm glad that we have even these abilities to do this, but it's difficult. So these are some of the obstacles. Let's say these are the primary obstacles in contemplating any kind of gene therapy for the brain. Otherwise, we'd all be doing it. So in my lab, we're trying to study artificial transcription factors. And uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, this is something that my research has been interested in uh, for a long time. And uh, all I would say about this is there are proteins whose natural job it is to bind DNA in a sequence-specific way. And many of these are transcription factors, which are proteins that tell the genes when to turn on and when to turn off. And the transcription factors usually have two parts to them. There's a part that specifically recognizes a DNA sequence, and then there's some kind of an effector domain that either activates the gene or represses the gene, usually by recruiting global repression or activation machinery in the cell. And um, one of the major classes of the DNA binding portion of these transcription factors is something called zinc finger proteins. And, uh, and there's just a, a protein structure that binds to, to DNA. And over many years, a number of labs, of which I'm a part of, I guess, um, have tried to understand how these proteins work and have tried to reprogram them to bind the sequence that we're interested in. So now, to some extent, we have the ability to, um, to decide you know, where we want to make a transcription factor to. So, for example, in the case of UBE3A, we could think about making an activating transcription factor that will just bind upstream of this UBE3A gene and hopefully activate its expression. Similarly, we could try to target a repression artificial transcription factor that will bind just here and nowhere else and try to shut off this long RNA from being made, and maybe that will actually activate this gene. And in fact, of these two strategies that we've tried in my lab, this one actually turned out to be the more successful for reasons that we still don't fully understand, but, uh, but we're going with it. So this is the protein that we made, and it has a part of the protein that binds to the DNA. Uh, it contains a small effector domain that actually is the business end where it tells the gene to turn on or off. And it's got a bunch of other stuff on it. But one of the main things that it has uh, that we think is important is this part that's called a cell-penetrating peptide. So we could deliver this artificial transcription factor with a viral vector by injecting it into the brain, uh, much like the other gene was delivered. Um, but in this case, uh, we're using the cell-penetrating peptide. And again, this is something that we've it's been observed in nature that you know, we've just stolen uh, as a biotechnology tool. But proteins that contain these cell-penetrating peptides have some ability to cross cell membranes, even the blood-brain barrier. So now we think that we can inject it interperitoneal. We can go into the mouse, cross the blood-brain barrier, go into the neurons, and actually regulate the gene in the neurons. So we have some preliminary data, unpublished data, that I'll show you now. Um, does it cross the blood-brain barrier? So here we've, uh, we're looking at uh, one of the protein parts of that protein that we injected. These are the uninjected ones, and this is a, a region of the brain. I think it's, uh, it's near the hippocampus. Um, so you know, not, a, not a very uh, 
rigorous uh, evidence here, but um, if we just look at the protein, it looks like it's getting in. This is a little bit more uh, impressive to me, at least. So here we looked at uh, some mice that were treated with this. So again, this was injected interperitoneal. And then we looked to see the changes in gene expression in the brains of the mice. And this is uh, with immunofluorescence, okay? So we're looking here at a region near the hippocampus, or at the hippocampus. This is a region near the cerebellum. And what you could see is if we take um, uh, Angelman syndrome mice that are not treated, uh, the panel is kind of dark. If we take the wild type mice that are expressing UBE3A, this panel is, is glowing green. And the treated mice uh, have some green in them more than the untreated mice, more like the wild type mice. So we don't know what this does to their behavior yet. We don't know a lot of things. But it looks like we're able to inject this thing, and it's able to regulate a gene in the brain. Uh, we can also look with something called a Western blot. That's just looking at protein levels. And again, without going into too much detail about what this all means, uh, this is kind of the negative level. You can see that this band is a little bit thinner than these bands. These bands look a lot more like the wild type mouse. So these are all treated mice. And this is the level of UBE3A in their brain. So we think that the levels are going up. We can even look at some simple behavioral tests, but um, I'm just going to skip to the summary. So I think that gene therapy could be an option if deterministic genetic information is known, but there's nothing you could do about it. You might be able to do something about it with gene therapy. Obviously, a field that's in its, still in its infancy, but I think showing a lot of progress. Um, genes can be regulated by drugs, gene transfer, and even things like artificial transcription factors. Uh, the blood-brain barrier presents a significant barrier. Uh, for the delivery of a lot of therapeutic for neurologic disorders, uh, whether they be uh, viral vectors or drugs or other things. It could be that ATFs with cell penetrating peptides um, are in fact able to cross the blood brain, brain barrier. Uh, at least they seem to do that in, in, uh, in our mouse model of Angelman syndrome. And, uh, if reproducible, this process could uh, provide a general method to control disease-causing genes in the brain. But uh, certainly, we have a long way to go to show that. In closing, I just want to uh, say that this last bit was done by people in my lab, particularly uh, Barbara Bayless, a graduate student in my lab, and Ben Piles, who's a, uh, an all-star mouse technician. And uh, I can thank the, the NIH and uh, Angelman Syndrome Foundation and a number of others for uh, generous funding over the years. And I thank you for your attention. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.